Welcome to the Toka Backstage Podcast. Join Toka's Executive Director, Chris Wolf, in conversations with the artists and people behind the scenes of the Torrance Cultural Arts Foundation's performances and events. Hi, this is Chris Wolf, the Executive Director of the Torrance Cultural Arts Foundation. It is my absolute pleasure to be speaking today with Liberty DeVito uh, from the Lords of 52nd Street, which will be in Torrance on Friday, May 13th at 8 o'clock. Um, and some of you may know, uh, well, first of all, uh, full disclosure, I've been a fan of yours since since I learned about you. Um, and it's I, I always found it interesting that Billy Joel was the guy, but everybody knew the band's name. I mean, everybody yeah, knew who you were and and Richie was. And yeah, it's funny. Um, you know, I always say like, if you could you could think about all the bands like uh, Billy Joel or uh, Bruce Springsteen or John Cougar Mellon Camp. You know, you 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 know me, you know Max Weinberg. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. You don't know any, any other bands, you know. Right, yeah. Even bands that are actual bands, you don't even know the drummer's name. Well, why, well, why do you think that is? Why do you? How, why do you think that? I mean, you walked out of that with people knowing who you were, as opposed to just it being Billy Joel. Well, I think we uh, developed the, the sound, the Billy Joel sound. We helped him, you know, develop that sound. Billy by himself, you know, you could tell by the first two albums he had out, Piano Man and Street Life Serenata. He brought in studio musicians to do those two records. Mm -hmm. And they're great songs, but they didn't have that punch. Then when he came, brought us in, yeah. we gave him that punch, that, that sound that he needed. And, so I and think that's why we're recognizable. Was Stranger the first album that you worked on? No, Turnstiles was the first one. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that one has New York State of Mind. You probably hate that one because you're out in California. But <laughs> <laughs> I got in trouble for that song, you know, in California. Really? Yes. Uh, we played the, uh, uh, what's the, the big place that everybody played years ago? Uh, forum? What's it called? The, the forum. forum. Yes, yes. We played the Forum, and it was at the same time that the Yankees had just beat the, the Dodgers in the World Series. So <clears throat> we're doing New York State of Mind. And there's a point where Richie Cannata does his sax solo in the middle. Right. all by himself you know and uh there's a spotlight on him and he gets done with his sax solo da -da 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 -da. and i walked right into the spotlight with a yankee hat on and a baseball bat over my <laughs> shoulder and i got booed <laughs> yeah well i could see i could say the california is very passionate about their teams i will say they, they are they are <laughs> but they can't they have to remember that they did that that team did come from here yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, so I, I understand that you wrote a book and I didn't know about that. I just learned about it recently. Um, uh, Life, Billy and the Pursuit of Happiness. What inspired that? Well, I actually started writing it many years ago just to give my daughters, I have four daughters, and uh, a, a family history of where my grandparents came from Italy and uh, what my father did in World War II, all that kind of stuff and what my life was like growing up. Uh, then when me and Billy parted ways, I thought, okay, I'm gonna write about me and Billy, you know? Uh, but then I thought to myself, you know, I'm not the kind of guy that's gonna throw people under the bus because I don't, I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna look at um, the way things are standing in Billy's shoes and why certain things happened. And I'm also gonna, you know, I'm, I'm tired of, of um, you know, American Idol and all those shows that you think the kid comes on, he sings a song, the next thing you know, he's got a record deal, you know. It, no, it, it, there's a lot of dues to pay, right? you know. And um, so what I did was wrote about how this, these immigrants came over from Italy. And then two generations later, one of their offspring becomes the drummer with one of the most popular single, single artists in the world. How did that happen? And that's what it does. It lists like all the bands I was in, things that happened. I mean, you know, there's, there's so many roads that you travel to get to the point where you are today. And some of those roads are very dark. I even wrote about the dark roads. 
You know, like we had one member, band member, Doug Stegmeyer, who when he parted ways with Billy, he just couldn't handle it. And he actually um, ended his life. Um, so, you know, there's all that dark side in there too, but there's also, the, the, it's funny and it's, you know, so I looked at it that way. And why did Billy do the things that he did, uh, make the decisions that he did? The man had a career for 50 years. You know, you, you have to, in this business, you have to make changes or, or you won't stay alive. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes it means you got to cut a person out and change the personnel in your band. It hurts, but you have to do that, you know? So that's, that's what the book is like. And then at the end of the book, I list all the songs that I played on with Billy, all the albums. And I, I put down what I remember about recording those songs. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay. Now I have to get the book. Cause uh, no, you have to get the book. You have to get the book. <laughs> um, the, it's interesting because I, I guess you sort of became uh, famous with Billy, but you had a life before that and obviously after that. Um, take us back to, I mean, how, how did you and Billy become, how did you become part of Billy's band? I'm not going to tell you. It's all in a book. You're going to have to oh, read okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, before that, now I knew Billy, I was probably 17, maybe he was 18. And he was in a band called The Hassles, and I was in a band called The New Rock Workshop. And we both played the same club on Long Island. It was called The My House. Uh, it was an underage club where kids could come in, and, and there was no booze served or anything like that. And we were both house bands, you know. So sometimes we would play together. But I would pass him in the dark and we would just say hi to each other, you know, like, and um, so I knew him from that. But uh, in that same crowd that was watching me play and Billy play was Russell Javers and Doug Stegmeyer and Howard Emerson. They used to come to the club and, and watch us. And Russell always said that I want, I'm going to be in a band with Liberty one day. I'm going I'm to do that. I'm going to be in a band with Liberty one day. Um, and when I turned like, I don't know how old it was. Russell was 15 at the time, and we tried to start a band, but it didn't happen. But later on, we started a band called Topper. It was myself, Doug Stegmaier, Russell Javers, and Howard Emerson. Well, Doug was the first one to get the gig with Billy because he was living out in California. He was on the Street Life Serenator tour. That was his second album on Columbia Records. He's touring, and he decides then he wants to move from California back to New York, and he wants to get the same musicians to record with him in the studio and to go on the road with him. Because in California, he was using studio guys and then taking a different band on the road. So uh, Doug says, uh, and then he says, and I want a New York style drummer, which meant aggressive and, you know, the way New York is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Doug said, well, you know the guy. And um, so I, I went and I auditioned for Billy and I got the gig. And our first thing that we did was to, to record turnstiles. So it was just me, Doug and Billy in the studio recording turnstiles. When, uh, when um, Billy said, he would listen to music and he'd say, I need guitars on this. Do you know any guitar players? And we said, yeah, we know two guitar players. We know Howard Emerson and Russell Javis. So Russ, uh, the topper band, became the Billy Joel band with the inclusion of Richie Cannata. So when people said, when I first saw you guys on that Turnstiles tour, that band was so tight. Of course we were tight. We played for years before we were Billy's band. Yeah. You know, it was like that kind of thing. And then, and then from, I imagine it's, it, it must have been kind of a, a crazy mindset to go from just kids playing in a bar in New York to, like you said, it, like one of the most popular bands around. Um, how, how did you guys handle that? Well, that took a, it took a little time. I mean, the turnstiles, it made them enough money to do another album. Right. You know, Columbia says, okay, you got one more shot. You had one more shot. So now he had the band. He was developing the sound. 
with the band because you know he would bring songs into the studio and we would do a little arrangements and stuff you know i make up my own drum part richard plays his own sax parts and we so we were really helping him out create these these songs what happened was the next that strain when he was going to record the stranger he was looking for a producer because he produced turnstiles by himself and uh, Columbia Records wanted him to do, he's a producer. So he approached George Martin, you know, the Beatles producer. Mm -hmm. George came to hear the band, heard us play. And when Billy met with him, he said, I want to produce, George said, I want to produce you. And, uh, but he said, uh, I want to use studio musicians. And Billy said, love me, love my band and turned him down. That's when uh, we were playing Carnegie Hall and Phil Ramone came and saw us play. And when he got us in the studio and he said, I want you to play like the rock and roll animals that you are, but I will tell you where to do it and where not to do it, you know? Yeah. So he, he loved us. He loved the way we played. He loved the creativity we had. He was asking a seminar once, what made Billy the icon that he became? And Phil said he wrote great songs and his band came up with great arrangements. You know, so it was a combination of, of all these things that happened to make him famous. So anyway, getting back to your original question, what was it like to go from nothing to something? There, the first place we played was in uh, Colorado. It was a club called the Good Earth. We were playing clubs. We played Danny Seraphine from Chicago's club. It was called Chicago. It was in Chicago, you know. Uh, we played this uh, uh, Santa Monica Civic Center when we went out out to California. I actually saw that concert. Did you? Yes. I, 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 I was. It was amazing. That's. I mean, that that was my entry into into uh, Billy Joel and the band. Was I saw the Santa Monica Civic and I I saw you guys twice at the Forum. I missed. Wow. The, I missed the uh, baseball. Um, you missed it, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I uh, yeah. So I, I was, I've been a fan for for quite a while. You know, it's funny because you, you know people always talk about, oh, I saw you guys here. Do you remember you when you did it? You, you remember different things than actually playing, like Santa Monica Civic Center. What I remember was checking into a hotel and a maid. That's all I remember about the Santa Monica <laughs> Civic Center. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the little things, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I honestly don't even remember who I went with. I just remember um, I had. I remember getting the tickets because I had to wait outside of Sears at the ticket man or ticket whatever it was, Ticketmaster, I guess. At the yeah, time. Ticketron. Ticket yeah, Master. Ticketron, and yeah. get my tickets, and then I I had like really good seats, and I was just I just remember getting totally blown away. We so, played. Um, um, where did we play? It was outside in LA. We opened up for Janiceum. Hmm. At the Greek? What was it? No. Oh, I don't know where it was. But anyway, um, the newspaper the next day read the best part of Janice, Janet Ian's, Janice Ian's show was Billy Joel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's not good when you have your opening act making better, better news than you. Yeah, but you know, um, it's another thing that you don't know because you just discovered the, the book was that Billy wrote the forward in my book. Oh, you really? Know. Yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, just to skip back real quick. So um, things, are, things are good with you guys. So the, you leaving the band didn't like uh, cause a big enough ripple to where, I mean, if, obviously if you wrote the forward to your book, all is good. Well, wait. It all is good now. It yeah. wasn't when. Well, yeah. no, no, it was a bad divorce. Let me tell you. Oh, I'm sorry. He got, he got the children. He kept the house. He got he got, he got everything. But um, um, yeah. So it was bad in the beginning. You know, uh, you you live in a bubble when you're in a band like that. You know, and uh, when the when the bubble bursts, it's like big. You know, I I went back to being Liberty DeVito again. You know. Yeah. Uh, instead of the Billy Joel's drummer, you know, but now, you know, it, it wasn't until um, I was having a, a problem dealing with it until a friend of mine told me 
he said, look, you got to stop saying that you were formerly Billy Joel's drummer or you used to be Billy Joel's drummer. No, no. You know who you are? You are the guy that Billy Joel chose to make those incredible records and those unforgettable tours. That's who you are. So that's who the three guys in the, in the Lords of 52nd Street are. We're the guys that helped him develop that sound. Yeah. So, so it's not a tribute band because I can't be a tribute to myself. I'm playing all the parts that I created, you know? Yeah. Well, and, it, it, somebody I said, uh, I think used the term legacy band, which I think is, is apropos. I mean, you guys are, you know, iconic in the rock and roll and you're just playing your, your music. That's exactly what we're doing. Just playing our music and loving it. Yeah. There's no more, there's no more maids and, but, um, you know, <laughs> we'll make sure you get a maid when you come out here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so after, after Billy Joel, you, you have, you've played with like a number of different artists. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I it's, it's funny. I, I would imagine. Well, I don't imagine. I, I would guess that people think, "Oh, you were Billy Joel's drummer. You, you hit the height of success. You guys broke up, and you wrote a book." But there's lots in between. I won't let you. I won't. I won't ask you to give away the rest of the book. But um, how did you? How did it feel going from like that, the pinnacle of success with Stranger and those albums to now trying to you know getting work used with other other performers well you know a lot of the people i played with were a lot of them were during billy well i was still playing with billy you know we have time off like recording with paul mccartney playing with stevie nicks that was all during when i was still with billy yeah after billy it was hot it was hard to get another gig because people think that oh if you play with billy joel he's getting millions of dollars every time he plays you know no, it's not like that at all. I'll tell you who really, really did me a solid. And um, it's it sad that she just passed away, but Ronnie Spector. I got a gig at the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. Myself and a bunch of guys from other bands, Ricky Bird from Joan Jett and the Blackhearts, Jeff Carlisi from uh, uh, 38 Special, and uh, Will Lee, who was in the most dangerous band in the world on the, on the Letterman show. And, we got together and we backed up every performer when the when the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame did a special event. The only thing we didn't do was the induction itself. We did all their other stuff. Yeah, you know, women in music, fundraisers, all that kind of stuff. Ronnie Spector came and and she was during the Women in of Music, and she heard me and then she wanted me to play drunk for her. That took me to a new level. Because now I, I was playing with one of the most fam famous single artists in the world, Billy. And now I'm playing with the queen of rock and roll, you know. Yeah. So that was, that, that was big. Her and Billy J. Kramer, who was signed with the Beatles, with the Beatles manager at the same time the Beatles were. And the Beatles wrote his first four hit records. Mm -hmm. um, I, I played with him. So I started to get the, these names again that... that uh, people were familiar with you know playing with ronnie i remember somebody turning to me and, and uh, they said well what are you doing now after billy you know that was a big deal and i said oh, i'm playing with ronnie Spector." and they were like whoa that's just as big you know <laughs> yeah everybody knows ronnie Spector. you know that, so, well, that's that's great though that you were able to i mean it's 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 like you said life has sort of this journey that you just sort of go down and it's it's yeah it's pretty amazing. And, and now, how did the Lords of 52nd Street come to be? I mean, obviously, you were, you were a band beforehand, but to actually sort of create it, to take it on the road now. Well, this, was this, this came together the same time that I was still, like, not well with Billy. We, mm -hmm. we still weren't talking. And um, we got inducted into the Long Island Music Hall of Fame. And uh, they asked us to play a song. So... You know, we had a couple of songs under our belt, but we ended up playing five songs that night. And uh, uh, people come up to us and said, you guys should be doing this. 
You know, there's so many tribute bands out there that are doing it, and they're not doing it as well as you guys do it. You should be doing this. So I said no in the beginning, because I was still like, I don't want to do this anymore. A friend of mine from the drum company called me and he said, do you really want to go back there? Do you really want to do that? You know? And I thought, and I thought, and Russell and Richie were calling, and, and, and I thought, oh, you know what? I think I, I do want to do it. You know, two friends of mine, Billy J. Kramer and Carmine Apice, who was in the Vanilla Fudge, both said to me, they said, just take the money. <laughs> you know, I, was like, <laughs> I was like, no, I, I don't know if I can do this again. But um, when we started to rehearse, it, I started to fall in love with the music again. You know, I'm uh, getting familiar again with the songs and I'm thinking about what it was like in the studio. You know, every time I hear, hear the songs, it was like I go right back to the studio and what it was like to record them. And I could see the guys and everybody in the positions we were all in. So now I'm loving the songs again. I'm playing with three, the three of us are together, the original guys in the band. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's missing is the guy that I used to look at for 30 years on stage and in the studio. You know, and we were friends. I mean, our families had Thanksgivings together and Christmases and stuff like that. So I was laying in bed one night just thinking about it and thinking like, it, it's gone far enough. You know, I don't know if you've ever had been in love with someone and you broke up and you meet a friend and you start talking about them and, you, and you're really bitter about the breakup and, and you say bad things about them and, and, and it kind of hurts you inside because you know you still love them, but you, you hate them, but you love them so much. Right. You know? yeah. That's the way it was with Billy when I, when I used to talk about him, you know, and say things. And um, so I felt really bad about it. And I sent him an email and I said, you know, I'm a little, I was a little unhappy about the way it ended. And he immediately wrote me back and he said, he, so was I, uh, so was I. So I said, well, I'm, he was living in Florida at the time. He summers in Florida. I said, well, the Lords of 52nd Street, who I'm playing with now, are coming to Florida. Want to have some uh, dinner or, or breakfast or whatever? He said, well, I got two little girls now and I put them to bed. So let's do breakfast. So I met him for breakfast and um, it was great. It was great. It was just two friends talking. We didn't talk about anything from the past, like the bad stuff. It was, it was uh, who's doing what now, who's died, who's sick, who's, you know, because we're at that age, of course. And, um, <laughs> you know, it was like, uh, like I, I write in my book that, that it was like, we were on a, this bridge, just staring down at these troubled waters that were going up and, and you know, and it was, it was just great. Now, people always used to ask me, they used to say, if you saw Billy in the street, what would you do? You know, this is when we still weren't talking. Mm -hmm. I said, I would go up to him and say, I love you, Billy. I'd give him a big hug and, and give him a kiss. So now after our breakfast and after talking, we are outside, he's getting on his motorcycle because it's starting to rain he's got to go home and I got to go do a gig. And so I, I grab him and I just put my arms around him. And I said, I love you, Billy. And I give him a kiss. And then he looks at me and he says, I love you too, Lib. And that's the way that that ended, you know? Yeah. And it, it was just great. It was just great. But it, during that breakfast, I said to him, I said, I wrote a book. And he went, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, 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 it's good. It's good. It's, I don't throw anybody under the bus. It's really good. I said, and if you're not doing anything, would you write the forward for me? <laughs> and he said, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. It was really cool. We also did the audio book and uh, he actually talked his part. Oh, wow. That's nice. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's nice to hear that, uh, that, that you're able to remain friends. I know that feeling where you, you have an issue with a friend, somebody you like, you know, have grown up with and then it's, there's issues and then it's like, you don't talk to each other. And then it's like, right. uh, there comes a point where it's like, okay, enough is enough <laughs> you know let's yeah just... I, we 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 had you know he always says that his songs were his children and i say that if his songs are his children and i'm at least their uncle you know <laughs> right so it, it's like we did so much together like beautiful stuff you are talking to me because of what i did with him right you, you know so it, a lot of people said that that it was really sad to think 
that the music they grew up on, there was this feud that had happened at the end. And now that we're friends again, it's like they can hear the music in a whole <laughs> another way. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. Cause I'm, I mean, I, I, uh, again, I was a big fan and then I think, um, uh, there came a point where I just, I, I, I sort of separated from it and it's like, I'm rediscovering it again now, just because, you know, I, I think there was enough time to where I, I didn't listen to it. And it's like, I'm rediscovering all, all those hits. I think something happened where I, somebody, I heard the stranger and I went, I haven't heard that in a long time. And so I started playing it again. But yeah, I I I, uh, I have to say that that uh, obviously the albums that you guys did are are by far my personal favorites. I think you know, I, Piano Man was great, Turnstiles was great, but you know, I think Stranger and Fifty Second Street were just amazing. Yeah, they were they were really good. I mean, I, I've been through his the phases because I played from turnstiles all the way up to i play at least on one song on river of dreams i play mm -hmm. all the other songs on all the other albums river of dreams i only play one on there because that's when it started to like you know yeah but um yeah so that that time stranger 52nd street glass houses that is the um uh, uh, that is the those are the songs that the the lords of 52nd street really based the show on Mm -hmm. Turns out strength when we were together, right? As as us, you know, me and Russell stayed during the bridge. We were on Nylon Curtain. Um, we were on uh, Innocent Man, all the way up to that. And I was the only one that was on Stormfront. And then came River of Dreams, and then it was the end, you know. So, but so we concentrate on the earlier stuff, which is the better stuff. More people like that, you know, the moving out and. It seems from the Italian restaurant, the Zanzibar, the, you know. Well, I think it truly really is true that you guys did sort of create a sound that, yeah. that, and it's funny, I mean, I, I, I just recently, preparing for this interview, learned that, that there was a New York style drumming. I just thought drumming was drumming, but um, I can actually see it, you know, whereas there's like the rock and, I don't know. I, I, I guess I could see that there would be a different, more aggressive style of drumming. Yeah, well, it's where you live. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I, you know, people say that all the time, like, like, oh, Billy's got a new drummer. He's nothing like you are. Yeah, because he's not me. He could play the parts that I created, yeah. but he can't play them like me because he doesn't think like me. He didn't grow up like me. You know, maybe his father didn't hit him in his head as many times as mine did. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you have um, an extensive musical background growing up? I mean, did you is did you always just gravitate to drums? No, it's funny. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, because I always loved music. You know, growing up, music was my salvation. I, I did have a, a, a father that I I knew he loved me, but I didn't think he liked me very much. You know, yeah. so um, my room was my haven that I would go in and listen to music. I would cut lawns when I was a kid. Uh, mow lawns or shovel snow and make you know two bucks or whatever and go buy records i would always buy records and um so i always loved music now later on in my career i asked my dad why did he buy me a set of drums when i was like 12 years old and he said because they didn't make prozac when you were a kid <laughs> <laughs> that's classic yeah <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and, and but that that was sort of started your your drumming career. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was, it, it took a little time to take off because uh, I was very shy when I sat behind the drums. I wouldn't play for anybody, and uh, I had joined the sixth grade school band, and the, I couldn't do the buzz roll in the Star Spangled Banner. And um, the teacher said, "Put the sticks down, Devito. You'll never do anything with the drums." So I got discouraged. And then uh, when I was in junior high school, I was uh, seeing these people that used to walk by and they were girls and I wanted to meet girls. But the girls liked the guys that played sports, you know? Yeah. So uh, that famous February in 1964, when the Beatles came on the Ed Sullivan show, that's when I pointed at the TV and I said, frig the buzz roll, <laughs> I want to do that. Nice. nice. You know, that's when I got, I got serious, you know? 
Well, um, the, the, the Torrance Cultural Arts Foundation, besides, you know, presenting uh, shows and concerts like the one you're going to be doing, um, one of the things we try to do is encourage and mentor young talent coming up. We do a, a talent competition and we uh, have, you know, try and find some kids to open for as acts. Um, but one thing I always like to ask the professionals is what piece of advice do you give to people who, who may want to like, who's, you know, practicing their drums, but they don't really know what to do next or what, what pieces of advice do you give to young performers? I always tell them the way to be a successful musician, magician, musician is to marry a rich woman. <laughs> ah, okay. That's good. No, no. Um, passion. It's all about passion. You have to be passionate about what you do because there's going to be times when you're, uh, it's not going to happen. You know, you got to be able to take disappointment. It's like being an actor or an actress. My, one of my daughters is an actress. She, she was living out in LA until she got this gig that was Chicago Med was on TV and so she had to move to Chicago. But anyway, there's so much disappointment in it. The only thing that carries you through is the passion because you don't make money for a long time. Yeah. You know, and especially today, the way the record companies uh, have their, um, their deals laid out, you know, they call 360 deals where they actually take everything, you know, you're left with a little bit, Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, it's, it's all about the passion, you know, you, as a matter of fact, I got a call today, me and this other guy are doing these uh, uh, little songs we're putting together for, for like, it would be for movie clips or for um, uh, commercials or stuff like that. And um, the person who's going to represent us said, you know, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of competition out there and they, they don't play that much. And I was like, well, I don't really care. I'm just having a ball doing this. Yeah. And I'd rather be like, yeah, that's us playing rather than that's my Mercedes out there. You know what I mean? I'd rather that. So you have to have that kind of passion, that kind of drive to keep going. You know, but I always say that your stomach will tell you when it's time to get another job. <laughs> You'll be starving one day and go, right. I got I to gotta go to, to, to uh, you know, whatever to, to get some work. Got to stop pumping gas. I don't know. Well, That's I, not a bad job these days, pumping gas. It's no, expensive but, enough. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Well, I I have to say I'm I'm. It's been an honor to talk to you, and I, I'm really looking forward to your performance again. That's the Lords of Fifty uh, Second Street on Friday, May Thirteenth at eight o'clock. Um, and don't forget to check out his uh, uh, Liberty's book, Life, Billy, and the Pursuit of Happiness. I'm going to go order my copy now so I can have you sign it when I see you in May. Fantastic. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. We were looking forward to it. And and uh, I guess well, I can't wait. I'm, I'm coming out early. My, I have a daughter uh, and now a granddaughter who will be one year old April 1st that lives in Lompoc, California. Oh, sure. Well, it's like an hour north uh -huh. of San Diego, uh, Santa Barbara. And so I'm going to fly into L.A. early, get a car and then drive up there and then come in nice. i can play you know i well, can't wait yeah it's going to be fun we're looking forward to it thank you so much for taking the time well thank you reunited after 30 years the legendary band that sold out countless shows in some of the world's most famous arenas on tour once again The Lords of 52nd Street aided in the creation of Billy Joel's hit records, including Turnstiles, The Stranger, 52nd Street, Glass Houses and Songs in the Attic. They've sold more than 150 million records. They helped establish Billy Joel's formidable sound, and they continue to perform those legendary hits still to this day. Richie Cannata. Liberty DeVito, Russell Javits, experience the magic of New York's favorite band. He knows it's these three they've been coming to see.
Experience the Lords of 52nd Street. Get your tickets now to experience Billy Joel's legendary original band live and in concert while tickets last. The Lords of 52nd Street.